is Taylor. I'm a, f a filmmaker and a photographer and a storyteller. And tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about my own transformation and metamorphosis in what I've discovered a story to be and also how they come together and are created. So we're going to jump right into 2014. I was just out of grad school and I had an opportunity to be a part of a filmmaking team that was going to go to Burma to solve a great geographical mystery. At the moment, it's still undetermined what the highest peak in Southeast Asia is. And in order to determine that, you have to stand on the top with a GPS. So this was a, a new foray and storytelling for me. And um, I was with five climbers, and my now husband and I were the, were the film team. And uh, we began our journey. So we walked 150 miles through the Burmese jungle uh, on our way up to Hakakabarazi, which was the mountain. And along the way, I you know, was learning how storytelling happens. And so you know, where you point your cameras and what types of things you focus on were a really big part of my learning experience in those years. Um, bug bites were, were a, a big one. As we made our way up towards the mountain, I became more and more curious about the people who we were with, the, the porters and the cooks who joined our team kind of on and off as we moved through 19 villages in the northern Burmese Kachin state. And eventually, we got to base camp after 150 miles. And very quickly, the team of five climbers uh, left. They left to go climb. And I stayed back to manage base camp, and my sole job was to charge the satellite phone from solar, and then if an emergency, I would get a radio call and radio for help. Very quickly, that all went wrong. Um, we had storms come in, 60 to 100 mile an hour winds, and not only that, um, the 20 porters that were with us at the time were really unprepared for the conditions. The, the fixer, the Burmese fixer, who had set up our expedition, had misinformed us as well as them as to what this was going to be like. So a lot of them arrived in sandals or in pajamas. Um, and it was, in, I mean, I was freezing. So, and alone. So right off the bat, I worked with the translator and told everyone who needed to go home or, or could go home that they'd get full pay and that um, they should go back down to their villages. And so all but seven left, and um, including the translator. And so for the next two weeks, I lived with these seven Ruang people, completely unable to communicate. And we were fighting for our survival. Um, we were building stone walls, battening down tarps. I had disseminated all the clothes that were left from all the, the climbers, given away my only pair of gloves. So by the second day, I had like these cold blister chillblains um, all the way up my hands and arms. And, but, you know, I, I wasn't cooking and I wasn't gathering wood. Um, and what I was doing was having a transformation about really what was this narrative that we were telling? Why were we in this place? You know, this was going to become a, a National Geographic feature article as well as a film. And, you know, being alone and kind of disconnected from the original purpose of our journey left me with a lot of questions. And at the time, I was also feeling pretty alone. This was our tent. This is kind of where we lived for those two weeks through storms. And eventually, it, you know, it occurred to me that one way or another, I was going to have to make friends. And so I would sit around in, the, in the, this tent here in the evening time around the fire, and these uh, Rawang people would sing Christian songs. The missionaries did a really good job in the 30s and the 40s, so everyone was hooked on Jesus and singing these wonderful religious tunes, and eventually the kind of, you know, the circle would come to me, and I'm sitting there, you know, kind of out of my element, and they're encouraging me to sing Jesus songs, and of course I don't know any, so I belted out the only thing that I could possibly sing with spiritual reverence, which was, uh, I want to be where the people are. <laughs> I want to see, want to see them dancing. And they didn't know, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and pretty quickly, we all became really good friends. So 
through song, through a willingness to overcome fear, through a really strong desire at that time to understand these people and disconnect myself from this preconceived idea of a narrative that I had going in, I formed really strong bonds in those two weeks. And I would go up to the top of the mountain and practice yoga when the sun came out, and they would come with me, and we would end up doing handstands and just, you know, being human beings in the same place at the same time. So after the two weeks, um, the, the climbing team descended down the mountain, and they came back uh, with ha having not succeeded in their summit, and um, a bit of drama had occurred on the mountain as well. And you know, my, my boyfriend at the time, my now husband, came down, he's like, you'd never believe it! We didn't summit, and all of these things went wrong, and you know, and I just like, I couldn't talk. I had had the biggest culture shock of my life. I was so connected to what these people were going through that this idea of a mountain summit seemed really foreign and um, you know, difficult to kind of wrap my mind around and re-engage as a filmmaker. But eventually I did, and we started our 150-mile walk out and took the opportunity to use a translator to host knowledge exchanges every evening in all the different villages. And so they would all get a chance to ask us as many questions as they wanted, and we could learn a little bit more about what was going on um, with them. Media is power. You know, Being able to create a story, share a story about another place in the world that's often not represented is power. And I wanted nothing more in those moments than to figure out how to share that power fairly. And so we... We took a lot of notes. The, the Rwang in that region don't have any representation in their central government. There is tourism and pending tourism coming up the valley. They're not sure exactly how they're going to benefit from that economically. Education is a challenge, but mostly just connecting with the people again and, and completely falling in love through that process of friendship. At the end of this trip, um, the film and the magazine article came out, and it was about the climb. And I think adventure stories are wonderful. I think that they inspire us all. But personally, I knew that it was my life commitment, basically, to find ways of co-creating narratives with the people who are often the subjects or, or the inhabitants of the landscapes in which our mainstream stories are told. That process for me is a lot about friendship and play. And then recognizing that if you were ever gifted the opportunity to tell a story about a friend, you would never tell it in a way that harmed them. You would only want to share their story in a way that was most beneficial. So that's kind of the guiding principle that I took away from that trip. In 2017 and 2018, uh, we got an opportunity to participate in a film project with the native tribes here in this country. And the film project's documenting how the genocide has been perpetuated um, through time up till today in, in many ways by removing people from their food systems, and thus from, from life, from culture. And I was sitting with the director of the film in the early stages of this project thinking, like, how can we do this better? How can we make this more inclusive? What does it look like when you share narrative power? What does it look like when you create space and opportunity to, to co-create like, what that story is? And so we asked the tribes specifically, like, what would make sense for you? And the answer we got was find a way to pay native photographers and native journalists to tell all of the stories that the film was telling at each of the locations and, you know, get those published in magazines and in newspapers. And rather than just this one single narrative about this one thing, create a whole body of work where multiple people's perspectives could, could come into play. This is my friend Allie. She's uh, in the Hoopa tribe. This was on a, one of the projects. This is Adam Sings in the Timber, the photographer that day, photographing salmon that we had caught on the Yurok River. And along with that, we actually put a call out on Instagram just to the country and just said, you know, we're, we're organizing these workshops. If you have cameras you'd like to donate, please do. And we got 50 DSLR cameras just from people around the country. Um, so in each place we went to, we also set up workshops, photography workshops, and, you know, left full kits of cameras and computers um, with no strings attached, no follow-up needed. Just, you know, these are the tools to share your stories, and, and we're excited to, 
to hear them. And so these are a couple of the photographs that the students took, just a perspective on what, what food meant that I, I don't think I could have ever quite captured. Empirical evidence has shown that seriousness does not actually help us whatsoever in understanding the human condition and the human heart. And that play can actually do a lot to help us. And that play can help us form those bonds of friendship and reach over those language barriers. And, you know, we've got quite a few barriers in our own country right now that I think we could find ways to reach over. And so I'm going to bring out one of my, my biggest teachers in this. Come here, buddy. Come here. Hi. Hi, bud. And, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Baloo has shown, this is Baloo. And, uh, you know, when I, when I think about communicating across language and communicating with, with non-humans, maybe someday communicating with aliens, you know, sometimes you just got to work with what you have. And so I'm going to see if Baloo will sing with me and maybe invite you guys to sing with me too. <laughs>